everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Richard Goldberg, Senior Advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Richard, thank you so much for joining me again. Great to be here as always. You join us every few weeks and you joined us last week as well to give us kind of a temperature check about what's happening in the Israel-Hamas war, what's happening in the Middle East in general. And over the past weekend, we saw Iran launch an unprecedented attack on Israel. And this came after Iran blamed Israel for the April 1st strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria. So what sticks out to you over the past few days? Can you describe the temperature there then and now? Yeah, I mean, I think for those who have been watching our uh, interviews over the past several months, uh, you'll remember, uh, I've always said Iran's hand is behind everything you see in the Middle East. Um, they uh, set fire all across the region, and in fact, in many other places of the world. They've been waging a seven-front war against Israel since October 7th. Iran itself, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Gaza, obviously, with Hamas, the West Bank and Yemen. Uh, and I think uh, over uh, many weeks and months, uh, as we were really hyper-focused on the tactics in Gaza, and uh, everybody sort of lost sight of the big picture, we forgot about the head of the octopus here uh, and all of its different tentacles. Well, Iran reminded us of that on Saturday night. I think everybody got that wake-up call remembering, oh, that's right, Hamas was a client uh, of Iran, Hezbollah that keeps firing missiles from Lebanon into Israel uh, is a subsidiary of Iran. The Houthis that keep firing missiles into the Red Sea are working for Iran. All the militias that have been attacking U.S. soldiers over months, killing three Americans in Jordan earlier this year, working for Iran. So Iran now is coming out of hiding. Um, the, there's no more uh, pretense here. Uh, it's on full display for all of us to see their aggression, their sponsorship. And remember, it wasn't just Iran firing the 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, uh, and a couple hundred drones at Israel, which we should talk about and will, but also their proxies launching them at the same time under Iran's direction, a very complex attack, a big night of defense for the state of Israel with support from its allies. One other thing to remember, a lot of people um, sort of like to start the clock here, the timeline on April 1st, uh, when uh, the Israelis uh, took out a top uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps commander uh, in Damascus, along with some lieutenants, uh, they were meeting in an IRGC compound adjacent uh, to the Iranian consulate there uh, in Damascus. The Iranians claim that their consulate was attacked. That is not, in fact, true. Uh, from all that I have seen and heard, in fact, the Israelis struck an IRGC operational headquarters uh, where they had been plotting a lot of the attacks uh, against Israel over these past many months. Uh, and of course, this war against Israel, this seven front war doesn't start on April 1st. It goes back obviously to October 7th and well before that for years, of course, before then. So Israel takes routine action whenever possible uh, to defend its interests, to defend its country, to take out these terror masterminds uh, this was a big get for the Israelis to take out such a large uh, terror plotter uh, of the uh, regime in Tehran. And then it became a waiting game of seeing how Iran would respond to that. And we saw that on Saturday night. And as you said, unprecedented, really crossing the Rubicon, something that I don't think many analysts ever thought they would see. 120 ballistic missiles fired at the state of Israel, the, the country the size of New Jersey. And these are not homemade rockets. These are ballistic missiles, medium range, intermediate range ballistic missiles intended to cause massive amounts of damage. And the fact that 99% of them were taken out of the skies by the US-Israel jointly uh, developed aero missile defense system, US fighter jets, some UK fighter jets, and some other air defense of even Arab partners and allies in the region is a great testament to the missile defense capabilities that we've built, but it's also a failure on all of our parts as a, from a policy perspective that Iran believed it could fire these missiles and get away with it and face no consequences. And that's, the part, that's really the point we're at today of evaluating what policies led the Supreme Leader in Iran to believe he could do this and pay no consequences, pay no costs, 
what are the policies that we would need to see now to change that calculation into a miscalculation? Richard, after this attack on um, over the weekend, you were the first person I thought of of talking to about it because I have a quote from you back in October. You said Iran's fingerprints are all over the various conflicts in the Middle East. We're using words like unprecedented. We're using phrases like crossing the Rubicon. You said this is something that not a lot of analysts thought we would see. So what do you make of the directness of this attack? Because Iran's not using its proxies here. Iran directly attacked Israel. They directly attacked Israel and they didn't do it just with a few drones or maybe even a couple of missiles that would have been provocative on, on, in its own right. We're talking about 120 ballistic missiles being launched at once towards the state of Israel, flight times of 12 minutes. Following, they had already launched 30 cruise missiles on their way, a couple hundred of drones on their way. This was a massive assault on the state of Israel. They wanted to do a lot of damage. They certainly wanted to test the systems and see what gets through, what doesn't get through, and then adapt for their next assault uh, in the future at some point. But this alone is just an outrageous action. And it just makes you wonder, how is it possible that the Ayatollah and Tehran could skip all the different levels of escalation straight to the top of a direct ballistic missile and cruise missile attack on the state of Israel, believing he wasn't about to suffer a massive military retaliation, that there wouldn't be an attack on his nuclear program in retaliation, that IRGC officials in Iran wouldn't be targeted, that the, that the Supreme Leader himself, the, that the, the regime might not be targeted in response, that at the very least there wouldn't be massive economic sanctions pressures coming back from the Biden administration and the rest of the world. Well, he looked at the state of play. He looked at the reality today. Three years plus of Biden administration appeasement policies. More than three years of European appeasement policies. And in that context, along with several weeks now of sustained political warfare against Israel, trying to isolate Israel, pressure Israel to back down, even threatening the cutoff of military assistance to Israel from the United States, Canada actually doing it. The Supreme Leader looks at this dynamic saying, this president is never going to do anything to us. These Europeans are never gonna do anything to us. Israel is on its own. They're in the middle of a war in Gaza. They have Hezbollah on its northern front. And the United States is going to pull them back from any retaliation that is meaningful. And so I'm going to test that theory and I'm going to lob 120 ballistic missiles and see what happens because I'm betting not much is going to happen. And here we are a few days later. And so far, the Ayatollah is right. And that's a very scary prospect for the future for a country that wants nuclear weapons and is building missiles not to reach Tel Aviv but to, t to reach Washington, D.C. one day with an intercontinental ballistic missile program. So if you like North Korea, you're going to love this because it's going to be North Korea on steroids with a lot of Islamic radicals waiting for the hidden imam to appear before they launch nuclear tip ballistic missiles at the continental United States one day. This is absolutely our national interest. They chant death to America, death to Israel, not the other way around. And we better wake up and understand that our policies are allowing this world to get a lot more dangerous. I want to talk about the response to this attack because various world leader, leaders urged Israel to show restraint here. President Biden said he called Prime Minister Netanyahu on Saturday after the attack, quote, to reaffirm America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel. But reports also indicate that President Biden said America would not show support if there was a response. What do you make of that response? Terrible. Uh, the worst possible thing that he could do right after doing the best possible thing he could do. Uh, and that's what the real just quandary of this presidency really is. Uh, inherently contradictory in its policies and strategy, which just projects confusion and weakness to our enemies. Uh, and so it's a great thing that the United States came to Israel's defense on Saturday night. I worked on Capitol Hill for a decade. One of the things that I focused on working for former representative and then Senator Mark Kirk was on the missile defense cooperation between the United States and Israel. We worked on this Aero missile program for years, making sure it was funded first uh, Aero 2 and then Aero 3. 
We worked on deploying an X-band radar into the Negev Desert back in 2008, uh, making sure that our satellite capabilities were fully integrated with Israel's missile defense capabilities, uh, supporting joint exercises between the United States and Israel to practice for exactly what happened on Saturday night. Our militaries have actually practiced this scenario for more than a decade. So this was uh, something that was years in the making, but a credit to the administration for stepping up and providing this overwhelming defensive support for Israel, along with the United Kingdom, that deserves credit as well. Then he decides to just pull Israel back and say, hey, congratulations, you just suffered the largest ballistic missile, cruise missile attack against your country in history, uh, an unprecedented assault by the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism on a quest for nuclear weapons. Please don't do anything now in response. And he tells that to the world, reassuring the Supreme Leader that this is now the new baseline for escalation. So it doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you want to have to put our country, the United States, in a position to not deter the Iranians from doing this again? In fact, encouraging the Iranians to do this again at an even more dangerous level, which means that we're going to be back at this at some point, providing the defense of Israel, working with the Israelis, as we will need to because they are a close ally. But wouldn't it be better to actually deter the Iranians from doing this again, of changing the Supreme Leader's calculation into a miscalculation so he pays a tough price right now, a high cost right now, and says, wow, I went too far, I'm not doing that again. Instead, we're signaling to him, great, great job. Hey, glad it worked out this time, 99% of what you sent over coming out of the sky. Not sure if it will the, the next time. We actually have administration officials saying that now to reporters. Not sure if it'll work out as well next time as a warning to Israel. Not sure if that's supposed to be a veiled threat uh, or an assessment of the technology, which looked pretty good on Saturday night. Uh, but the bottom line is you're not supposed to be a turtle just taking constant ballistic missiles and cruise missile attacks. It's not a way to live. It's not a way any democracy can live. You know, the idea of missile defense is to ensure you don't get destroyed in a missile attack so that you have time to respond, restore deterrence, or actually degrade or destroy the enemy that attacked you. That's the point of missile defense. The idea that you're just going to sit here with a force field around you and say, Nana and boo boo, you can't touch me. That's not how it works. So I I'm very, very distraught by the president's reaction and more so, the inaction in non-military areas. Equally as important. Right now we have a $10 billion sanctions waiver that the president just reissued last month, giving the Islamic Republic of Iran access to a new $10 billion to spend as they want on what they call non-sanctionable areas, debt payments, imports, all kinds of stuff. It's budget support. That's what it is. $10 billion that they get here to spend over here, $10 billion freed up over there for illicit activities. We've been letting their oil flow to China without enforcing a single sanction for more than a year. Why? All part of this appeasement accommodation uh, campaign to try to keep the Iranians uh, from escalating further on their nuclear program in particular. And we have not worked with the Europeans to get them to designate the Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization, or snap back the UN sanctions that we could do very quickly with a letter to the Security Council and bring back the embargo on their missiles and their drones and their conventional arms and all that. Why aren't we doing any of that? And, and can you imagine we aren't changing any of these policies after Saturday night? Okay, it's one thing on the military side. I get it. It's controversial. It's, escal it's escalatory. You have to think about the next moves here. What's Iran going to do? What are you targeting? You got to think that through. It doesn't have to be today. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. But even in the non-military tools, nothing is changing. There's going to be some symbolic sanctions actions while the money keeps flowing to Tehran. Absolutely, we are rewarding Iran for what they just did. We are paying the regime for attacking our ally, attacking Americans, and setting fire to the Middle East, distracting all of us, and dislocating the economy. We have to stop this policy of accommodation and appeasement. It is what is leading to escalation, not our ally.
I do want to quote the Biden administration on their sanctions. They said that they're imposing sanctions on uh, Iran, quote, including its missile and drone program, as well as new sanctions against entities supporting the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and Iran's defense ministry. From what you're saying, though, you don't believe this is enough. Well, not that it's not enough. It's just completely uh, a deception. They have created a strategic communications plan to make it look like they are imposing sanctions, while in practice, they open up the spigots for tens of billions of dollars to fund all of these entities on the sanctions list. So they will tell you, we've imposed 500 sanctions since we came into office. Well, that sounds very important. That sounds very nice. And if I don't know anything about sanctions, I'd say, wow, 500 sanctions, my, you've been really busy. But nobody asks, what is the meaning of these sanctions? What's the impact of these sanctions? Are these entities losing money? Are you denying resources to the regime? How much money have you squeezed out of Tehran's coffers since this campaign began? Oh, actually, you've increased the amount of revenue to Tehran since you came into office, and you've accelerated their revenue in the last year alone. Oh, you're making them whole for $10 billion more in budget support right now with a waiver. Oh, you're, you're letting their oil flow to China so that they get $100 billion since you came into office with more accumulating every month. What, where does that money go exactly? What is that money being used to fund? All the 500 entities on a sanctions list are being bailed out by this administration's sanctions relief policies at the same time. They're hiding the ball. So we're going to see more of the same, I fear, in the next coming days. Coordinated with allies, it's going to be a big show. More lists of people and entities they're putting on sanctions. We're sanctioning the missile program. We're sanctioning the drone program. Really? We're funding the missile program. We're funding the drone program. You can't have it both ways. You can't give them access to billions of dollars and say you're imposing pressure on this regime. Because guess what? It doesn't matter what a media personality believes or an influencer or a congressman in Washington, a talking head on television from the State Department. The view from the Beltway is interesting, but completely unimportant to reality. The only view that matters is the one from Tehran. Because they get the joke. They know whether or not they have more money today or less money today. They know if they feel pressure or don't feel pressure. And if you follow the money, that old saying, you will, you will quickly realize they don't feel pressure. They understand what's happening. They know that there's an appeasement policy that's not breaking. From their position then, from, from their, their viewpoint, position. because you're saying that's the only one that matters, do they consider the attack on Saturday night a win in their books? I think they do, yes. I think that they might be surprised at how effective the missile defense uh, held. I think they might be surprised at the capabilities of U.S. jet aircraft uh, that were on display, uh, as much as the capabilities of the aero system and other missile defense layers of Israel. So that might be a little bit surprising to them. But that doesn't mean it's, it's a loss um, or unsuccessful to have launched 120 ballistic missiles and pay no consequence because what they have done effectively is reset a lot of assumptions overnight, strategically. Uh, I'll give you an example of one. Uh, we've all assumed for a long time that Hezbollah is the deterrent on Israel's northern border for a strike against Iran, the Iranian nuclear program that if there's this massive 200,000 rocket, missile, drone threat in southern Lebanon, as there is today with Hezbollah, that could inflict massive damage on Israel, that if the Israelis are going to be at some point going to destroy the Iranian nuclear program, they have to think about Hezbollah being unleashed all across the state of Israel, and they might need to preempt any strike on Iran with a strike against Hezbollah. That dynamic's been playing out for months now as we've seen Hezbollah on a daily basis increasing their rocket, missile, and drone fire against Israel and the talk of potential escalation there in Lebanon. 
Well, after Saturday night, I think we should all sort of step back and say, wait, if there's a war between Israel and Hezbollah of an even greater scale, maybe it's Iran that gets involved with ballistic missiles and cruise missiles against Israel while Israel's fighting Hezbollah. So now Iran has completely changed the dynamic of defense planning and strategy because they're unafraid and go unpunished for launching ballistic missiles and cruise missiles from their territory. So this is a game-changing moment if there are no consequences, and I don't think people understand that. The second piece here, if, if they pay no price, no consequence for launching this type of attack, is there really anything that we would be willing to act upon with military force if we saw a threat? If they actually decided to develop nuclear weapons and cross the finish line, they're at the one yard line, let's say they go across the goal line into the end zone on nuclear weapons development. Uh, what is the Supreme Leader to take away from Saturday night and its aftermath? I think the risk of Iran actually completing that is going up now. And that's, again, a calculus that we need to understand, that the Israelis will need to understand, the whole world will need to understand, because if we're this deterred by Iran, if we're this afraid of escalation, if Iran and its prophecies can shut down the Red Sea for commercial shipping and shock the oil markets with threats without nuclear weapons, what do you think is going to happen to this world when they have nuclear weapons? It's a really interesting question, and as you said, Clearly, assumptions need to be reset here. And I am curious, as we look into the future, what a response is going to look like. Israel did say that they will respond. What that response looks like does remain to be seen. But I am curious, is there any type of response that Israel could act on that would be de-escalate escalatory in nature or i mean the term world war three has been flung around do you think an escalation could perhaps make that come true i i'm not uh one to talk about world war three here uh it's a contingency um it's a hypothetical you'd have to put a lot of different assumptions on the table um and and certainly we need to be prepared for any contingency uh, but I don't buy into this idea that we're sort of on the precipice of World War III here. I don't think that that's correct. Uh, ultimately, if the Chinese decide to invade Taiwan uh, and escalate in the Taiwan Strait, that's that's the ball game. Um, and and at this point, we don't see that happening today. But obviously, we're very worried about that happening in the short few years ahead, especially once they perceive they are at overmatch uh, of U.S. forces in the Indo-Pacific. Um, on the Iran question and on Israel specifically, on, on what they would do, what they wouldn't do, uh, would they escalate, would they de-escalate? I think the Israelis are in a, a kind of a squeezed moment right now. Uh, the United States uh, president has been engaged in sustained political warfare against Israel for weeks now. Um, they are under intense pressure not to complete the campaign to dismantle Hamas in Gaza. They face an even greater threat on their northern border. All their towns in northern Israel still are evacuated. 100,000 Israelis dislocated uh, out of their homes uh, because of the threat from Hezbollah, a president that is not backing them and escalating to try to push that threat away from their border. Uh, now the Iranian threat escalating to this extent. Uh, and so how do you balance all of these critical strategic needs all at once? Uh, between fighting the proxies, fighting off Iran, not allowing this to become a new normal, the squeeze from the President of the United States saying, hey, we're willing to do something now, we're going to be nicer to you, but we want you to stand down. Um, and then the question is, what exactly is the United States willing to do? What is Great Britain willing to do? Uh, Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, former Prime Minister of Britain, was just in Israel. Uh, meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He came out of the meeting and said, I think the Israelis are still going to do what they're going to do, even after I asked them not to. Well, why is that? Well, I think the, the meeting sort of went like this. Cameron rolled in and said, hey, uh, please don't escalate with the Iranians. Please don't retaliate. I'll tell you what, we're going to increase the pressure on Iran if you don't retaliate. And Netanyahu probably looks at him and says, wow, really? What What are you going to do? Are you going to put the IRGC on your terror list finally? Or 
Are you going to snap back UN sanctions to increase multilateral pressure on Iran? And Cameron probably said, no, 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 no. Th those, th that'd be very escalatory. We, we're, we don't want to anger the Iranians too much. We just want to do something. But we'll do something. And Netanyahu probably looked at him and said, thank you so much for helping on Saturday night. We appreciate the support of Great Britain. Thank you for visiting Israel. Here's the door. Uh, because Israel needs to impose serious consequences. This is not a strategic communications game. This is not a PR stunt to give some political cover to Israel not to retaliate, which is how Biden is treating this, which is how the British and European diplomats are treating this. This is existential for the state of Israel. Iran just launched 120 ballistic missiles. There's no PR stunt that changes the strategic equation at this point, other than imposing serious consequences on Tehran for doing so. And so if you're not at least coming to change your strategy to go from accommodation to pressure with the primary tools to accomplish that, and you're trying to get the Israelis not to react, not to respond, you are absolutely guaranteeing that we are going to see further escalation and that Israel's survival is more at risk than ever before in history. So I think you're going to have to see an Israeli response. It could be mixed. They could temper the response in the short term, planning on something stronger in the long term. They could mix between covert activities, cyber activities, and kinetic activities. So obviously they're under pressure right now from the president not to do something major. They may honor that request. Uh, but obviously also the Iranians are at highest alert right now. And as they say, revenge is a dish best served cold. Uh, and so why not sort of wait until the Iranians all go home? Alert status has uh, declined. Uh, and uh, the people who are right now heavily guarded and not available to be targeted suddenly become available to be targeted. And facilities start having vulnerabilities. Uh, that might be the moment you'll see an Israeli response. Richard Goldberg, per usual, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you so much for your expertise and insight. And as the situation develops, I hope you come back on again and break it down with me. You bet. Thank you.